Welcome to Heartland iCampus. We're so excited that you're here viewing with us today. We love worshiping with our Heartland family all across the world, so let us know where you're viewing from in the comments below. We want to give you the opportunity to partner with us, so look for our giving icon and you'll be able to sow into all the different ministries that we have here on a weekly basis. Let us know how we can be praying for you or even the great things God's doing in your life so we can celebrate with you. Just email us at pastorphil at hcc3d.com. It looks like service is getting ready to start. I'm excited for what God's gonna do for us today. If you guys wanna stand with us, we're gonna sing one more song. says thank you pastor Lindsay. thank you worship team hey you may be seated this morning hey again thank you so much for joining us i'm glad you're here and uh, for some of you uh, some of you know that yesterday we had a special event that happened in our family with our daughter amber getting married alan that was a great day and uh, some of you celebrated that fact with us but also we had we had special guests coming in from uh, uh, alabama and kentucky and uh, I just want to introduce them to some of you. You know, some of you think that I, maybe I'm, I'm jesting when I tell you people sometimes that I have, I can count my close friends on one hand. And uh, that's, I don't even need all five fingers, to be honest with you. Now, I have a lot of acquaintances. I have a lot of people I know. But I'm talking about close. I'm talking about people that if you're in trouble and you're about to get arrested and get thrown in jail, you'd call them. Come on. You, how many knows you need those kind of people? Well, I have two of those families with me today, Henry and Linda Griffin. We go back 42 years that, Henry, would you wave? Linda, would you wave? They're from Kentucky. Uh, Henry and I, we have absolutely nothing in common other than loving God and loving our family. 
I mean, we, 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 don't, we don't play golf. Well, I mean, we tried to play golf, and that didn't work out. But we, we don't. But we've had a connection 42 years. And uh, Henry is, has been such a close friend to me. He's cleaned my clock a few times when I needed to be cleaned, Ernie. You know, when you need people in your life like that. Henry and Linda has done that for us. Henry, Linda can make the best chocolate pudding cake you ever eat in your life. I stopped eating it. I'm not sure about Henry yet, but <laughs> I, loved, I love this couple. What a great influence they've had on our life. They've seen our kids grow up and do so many things. The other couple that we have with us, again, they go back almost the same amount of time, 40 years with them, Glenn and Wanda Craddock. Would you wave? This is, this is some of our, our grandparents, and people don't understand sometimes when we think, well, how many grandparents do you have? How many parents do you have? And, uh, Glenn, and Glenn is one of those guys, only he and my mom and, and my dad sometimes would, would use my name, Philip Dale. Glenn, when, when, when there's times when he needed to say something to me that maybe wasn't a real night, he would say, Philip Dale. And uh, they passed, they were, they were at a church, our first church we pastored. I was 25 years old, thought I knew everything, didn't know hardly anything. They loved us through that whole time and has always been supportive. Now, the reason I'm proud of couples like this is it lets you know I still got people that heard me 25 years ago. They'll travel all the way to Indiana to hear me preach again. Now, that's pretty good, folks. Listen, that'll let you know this man may be, may be okay. And then my mom's been up with me for the last two weeks. She has to go home tomorrow. I'll be taking her home. But mom, wave at everybody. She's been special. 85 years old. She is a very special lady. The queen of the Willingham family. Let me tell you, she runs everything in our house. Now, since dad has gone, she is the boss. When she wants to go, we make arrange for her to get there. So I love this family. I love what they've done. Would you give them a good hand clap and just thank them? Yeah, and, and so much. So I want you to open your worship, God. We've got a great promise this morning that I want to take you to. And I, I hope you'll help me kind of walk ourselves through this as we navigate this verse. And basically, if you've been with us for the last several months, since January, we've been talking about the promises of God. And one of the main things that we've talked about is just simply the fact that in a world of broken promises, God can be counted on. Say that with me. In a world of broken promises, God can be counted on. And this morning, I'm going to take you to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It's a powerful verse, and we're going to navigate ourselves through this verse from Apostle Paul's mindset and his view as he wrote it un under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Here's what the promise says. Now to him who was able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Unto him that is able to do far more abundantly according to the power that works within us. Now listen, as, as, as I start this message this morning, I want, you, I want you to ask yourself two questions. Two questions is where I want you to navigate your, your mind as I walk you through this. The first question is simply, do you believe God is as powerful as Ephesians 3.20 says he is? Do you believe God is able to do what Paul says he's able to do? Most in this room and those watching online, our East Campus has joined us, our North Judson Camp. Listen, most of us would say yes, but here's the second question. Here's the one that I want you to be more honest with yourself as we navigate through this story today. The second question is, if I believe God is as powerful as the Bible says he is, does my life reflect it? Am I living my life in such a way that people could say he or she believes that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that they ask to think according to the power that is at work within them? And listen, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, a, a statement that I put in your notes this morning. As Christ followers, 
We should never measure problems by our capacity to deal with them. As believers of Jesus Christ, as followers of his word and him leading our life, listen, we should never measure our problem by our capacity to deal with them. Listen, difficulty, and we have it. How many, how many understand we have difficulty? Troubles, struggles, whatever. Listen, difficulty must always be measured by the capacity of the agent that's doing the work. Paul said that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask a thing. According to what? Not according to me. It's not according to, to my uh, uh, efficiency. It's not according to my ability. But the agency that is at work here in Ephesians 3 and 20 is the power of God. And listen, where we can make the shift, and some of you are going to have to shift today, where we can make the shift from believing something in theory, I believe that God is powerful, to moving it into practice. It comes when we begin to understand the capacity to be able to deal with stuff isn't up to me, it's up to God. He is the one that is at work in our lives. So watch this, let me me dissect for just a few minutes, this, this, word, this, this verse. Here's the first phrase. Look at that. Paul says, God is able to do. He's able to do. Now, what's this? listen, Paul is describing the power of God. He's simply talking about, he's simply reminding us that the God that we serve, he's alive. He's active. That God is work. Now listen, I know it's simple and yet it's profound because listen, so many times we look around in our culture and we think it's impossible for God to do certain things. Oh, we believe in theory he's able to do exceedingly, but in practice we say, oh, but that's so hard. And Paul starts out by saying, listen, I want to remind you that God is able. He's far able, more than able to do the things that we can even ask to think. So here's the second phrase. Look what he said. Look at those three words. He said he's able to do far more abundantly. Paul said that God is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think. Now, here's the thing, that word abundantly, that word abundantly in the Greek, it's a very descriptive word. In the Greek, the word abundantly, it doesn't just mean that God is able to do more. In the Greek, it means that God is able to do super abundantly in quantity and quality. It's a descriptive picture that Paul is trying to get us to see what God is able to do. He's able to do far more than than what we can imagine. But he isn't just saying he's able to do more. He's able to do it in quantity and quality. I mean, Paul is kind of hyper-descriptive language. I mean, he's over the top right here. Why? He's trying to get us to understand that's the kind of God that we're walking with in this time today. I think he's trying to describe the undescribable for some of us. And most of us know what that is. You ever, you ever, you ever been to the mountains and seen the mountaintop? Or you've seen the sunset and, and, and you, 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 you experienced it? And you come back and you try to explain to somebody what that was like. Oh, Pastor Phil, you don't understand. Standing there looking at those mountaintops, seeing that sun set. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, I just, I just felt so much emotion when I seen the handiwork of God. And I think, it was a sunset. It's mountains. I've lived in Kentucky. I've seen mountains. But listen, so many times when we try to describe something, Many people don't get it. That's what Paul is trying to do. He's trying to describe the undescribable. Our God is able to do far more super abundantly in quantity and quality. The second thing I think Paul is trying to bring the light here is his confidence in God. You know, again, in theory we say, oh, God is able. In practice we say, oh, but I don't know about this. 
But here Paul writes under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he comes up with this concept. And he said, listen, I want to tell you how confident I am in God being able to do super abundantly in quantity and quality. More than you ever ask or you think. It'd be like you coming up to me and you saying, hey, Pastor Phil, can you do 10 push-ups? And I just casually say, well, sure, I can do 10 push-ups. I can do 10. But then if I really felt confident, I might say to you, well, I can do more than 10 push-ups. And if I'm really, really confident, I might say to you, well, I can do twice the many than 10. I can do 20 push-ups. But if I'm really, really confident and getting a little cocky in my ability to do, I might say, hey, I can do far more exceedingly, abundantly, in quantity and quality of all the push-ups you want to see happen. And you think, wow, that dude must do some push-ups. Right? Come on, come on. This is what Paul is saying. He's coming to us. He said, I'm trying to describe the undescribable. I'm trying for you to understand that the God is able to do more than, more than just able to do something super abundantly in quantity and quality, more than you can even ask so you think. Now, he could have just wrote, well, God is able to do things. And we would have said, oh, I believe that. Or he could have wrote, well, God is able to do more than. And we think, well, yeah. But he said, no. He says, God, the God that we serve, the one that we're being called to, the one that we want to follow, he's able to do super abundantly in quantity and quality more than you're able to even ask or you think. You see that? So he says, God is able far more abundantly. Now watch this. Here's the next phrase. All that we ask or we think. The super abundant God that is able to do more in quantity and quality is able to do more than all that we ask or we think. You understand when the Bible talks about prayer in the Bible, when the Bible talks about communicating with God in the Bible, he's talking simply about prayer is what gives us access to the throne room of God. And we have this super abundant, more than enough God that is standing there waiting to hear us, but we have to ask for it. We have to be willing to say, I'm going to ask for this. Prayer is what puts us in that dimension of getting access to God to say, God, this is what I'm asking for. But then he didn't say just ask. He said this God that is able to do far more abundantly in quantity and quality is able to do more than you ask or you think. Listen, listen can you understand that as we start thinking and we start dreaming, and we start imagining. When was the last time you sat down and you just said, God, I just want to spend the next 15 minutes thinking and imagining and dreaming about what you can do with my life? When was the last time you stopped what you were doing and you said, God, how could you use my life for your glory? Do you ever imagine God doing more for you than what's happening right now? Do you ever imagine him doing more than working 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week in a secular job and not understanding that even I'm in the world, God's still got a purpose for me in my life? Listen, I submit to you, here's what me thinks. Me thinks we don't dream enough. Me thinks... We don't imagine enough. So it brings us to this point that we struggle to believe this promise. Because we don't spend enough time imagining and thinking about how God could use us. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Pastor Phil. You just asked me earlier, did I believe Ephesians 3 and 20? Is God able to do more than we can ask or we think? And everybody said, yes, in theory. Oh, I'm preaching. Come on, East Campus, you better help me. We say yes in theory, 
When was the last time that your life reflected it? When was the last time you tried something that you knew that you were going to fail if God didn't bail you out? We struggle to believe it in application. In theory, the vast majority says yes. In practice, some of us say, I don't know. If I ask you, do you believe God can bring revival to your neighborhood? Yes, he's God, Pastor Phil. God could send revival. If I ask you, do you believe God could bring revival to your neighborhood and you be used to bring it? Oh, come on. In, in, in theory, yes. In practice, I don't know, Pastor Phil. You don't know where I live. You ever been in my neighborhood? You don't know the kind of neighbors I deal with. You don't know the people. You don't know the heathen. Listen, listen. Can I tell you, most of us without hesitation, we say, yes, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more in quantity and quality than we ask the thing. But when it comes to practice, that's when we hang up the phone. We say, I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Paul says, he's able. When was the last time when you look at the opioid problem in Northwest Indiana? When was the last time you looked at the drug problem, the alcohol problem, the broken home problem, the foster problem? You understand that Indiana is the number one uh, uh, state in foster children? When was the last time you looked at the foster issue, the opioid issue, the drug issue, and you say, God, how could you use me to make a difference in this? God, what could I be used for to somehow or another start moving the tide and going the other way? I believe that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly of all that I can ask the thing in quantity and quality. But, oh, I'm not sure if God can use me. Well, I'm preaching. I am so high five to Pastor Phil. When was the last time you looked at your kids or your grandkids? And you say, God, this generation needs to see you and know you in a powerful way. When's the last time you looked at those kids and say, God, I can only imagine how you could use my kids in doing that. When's the last time you looked at those grandkids as you held them and you, you have dreams and imaginations of what their future is going to be like. And you looked at them in the midst of all the education and all the degrees you want them to have. And, but when's the last time you looked at that child and you said, God, how could you use my girl to reach somebody that doesn't, could you use my son somehow or another to reach the unreachable people? God, I can just imagine the gifts and the talents, the abilities that you can raise up within my kid. I can only imagine more than we even think about. Listen, here, here's, 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 here's my thought. I know it scares some of you to think the way I think, but let me tell you how I think. Me thinks, God thinks, we pray wimpy prayers. We pray wimpy prayers. Most of our prayers are, God, help me with my health. God, help me be comfortable. God, I'm going to travel and I need your traveling mercies. Now listen, God's concerned about your health. God's concerned about your comfort. God's concerned about your travel. He wants you to travel safe. I think God sometimes looks at us and says, hey, do you understand? I wrote Ephesians 3.20. I put it in the Bible that I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask so you think more in quantity and quality and you're asking me for traveling mercies? What would you think if I could pull some strings and today, after service, I told you that Bill Gates is going to be in our building and after service, he's going to allow people 
to ask for anything that they want, and he's going to grant it. Now, for those of you that don't know, you haven't looked recently, Bill Gates is only worth $99.6 billion. Hey, church, Bill Gates is going to be out in the Connect Center, the hub, after church, and he tells us that anything that we could ask or think, he's going to give it to us. You know what I think? I think some of you would get right and leave right now and go get in line. I'll be honest with you, I'm not even sure I'd finish preaching. I'd say, you got to watch the 9 o'clock service. I'm going out here getting get in line. <laughs> Bill Gates is there. The second thing I can't really believe. If you knew somebody is worth $99.9 billion and he's told you that he's going to give you anything that you asked to think, are you really going to show up to him and say, hey, Bill, I'm just so, whoa, how pastor feels. He is the greatest pastor in the world. He got you in our house. Oh, I knew he's a man of God. I knew he's a man of God. Oh, by the way, Bill, could you help me have a good day? Bill says, really? I can do anything that you ask to think, and you want a good day? Or, listen, some of us go out there and say, hey, Bill, hey, wow, man, I'm glad you're here. And I got this $239 utility bill. Bill, Bill, I I don't want to put too much pressure on you, Bill. I know $99.9 billion is... Not a lot of money. Liar, liar, pencil on fire. But Bill, you think you could pay my utility bill this month? I mean, Bill, I mean, oh, I'm, I'm so unworthy, Bill. I'm so unworthy. But just give me my utility bill. What do you think Bill Gates would do with those kind of requests? I submit to you because I have him here. And I've told him, Bill, would you grant anything that people ask a thing? I submit to you, Bill would look at me and say, you know what? Have a good day. Or, you know what? Here's the check. Your utility bill's paid. But Bill would say as you walk off, hey, just for the record, I got $99.9 billion. And just for the record... I could do more than you can imagine to think exceedingly in quantity and quality. So I just want you to know, even though you're walking off from this place right now, I want you to know you're selling for a whole lot less than what you could have had. Now somebody says, Pastor Phil, you mean his bill's not going to be out there today? I'm disappointed. I'm sorry. But do you see how that illustration ties into the God that we serve? You see how that illustration ties into the fact that we come to church and we put our prayer requests in and we raise our hand and we're asking God to bless us. We're asking God to help us have a good day. We're asking God, Lord, just help me so I know that to get through this struggle, you know, this trial. You know, I, I fried some chicken and my husband's mad about chicken frying and, and I just don't want to argue, God, help me. And God is looking at you, yeah, I'm going to help you with your good day. I'm going to help you with your marriage. But God is looking at you and saying, listen, I want you to know I'm a God that is able to do far more abundantly in quantity and quality than you ask to think. You're asking way too small. Your prayers are too little. Got to get big prayers. The reason we don't ask or think or believe in practice because we don't know who we are in Christ. Listen, you read, you read Matthew 5 and 14. You read John 7, 38. And you read Ephesians 1, 11 through 12. And you read Romans 6 through 4. And you read what, what Jesus told Peter in Matthew 6 and 16 and 15. Listen, you read what the Bible says. Who are we in Christ? Listen, the Bible says we are light shining. We're new life given. We're darkness overpowering. We are praise producing. We are a river of life flowing. We are hell's gates trampling victorious, unstoppable force of God and he said that's who you are why aren't you living that way Woo. you 
in theory. Oh, I'm the light of the world. In practice, you go to work and you say, I hope nobody don't ask me about Jesus today. I get so embarrassed and I just don't know what to say. In theory, he said you have new life living. You have darkness overpowering, praise producing, river of light flowing, hell's gate trampling, victorious, unstoppable force in God. But in practice... God, I just hope I can get through this week. I just, God, I just hope I want somehow or another just help me. Do you believe Ephesians 3.20? Listen, every one of us, including me self, including me, every one of us have got to move away. We are so comfortable in the church of America of saying we believe stuff in theory, but in practice we fail the test the proof is not there if Ephesians 3.20 doesn't describe your life either one or two things either you're not a believer yet or you need to repent and start asking God for bigger and start thinking God for bigger things And if you're not a believer yet, and I'm up here standing, preaching and sweating and yelling at you about who God is, listen, I can understand. You're trying to put your, 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 your head around the fact that can God really do that when you have seen the witnesses sometime of so many Christians who are wimpy Christians, who pray wimpy prayers, and they don't have bold enough faith. I can understand that. But listen, don't give up on God because somebody that you saw have reflected Christianity that doesn't believe in the power of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change, and he wants to show himself to us. Wow. I love the story in Mark chapter 9. When this man comes up to Jesus, I'm going to paraphrase here for time's sake. This man comes to Jesus and said, Jesus, I brought my son. He's got a spirit that makes him mute. He has, it seizes him at time. He throws himself down on the ground. He foams at the mouth. He grinds at the teeth. And I brought him to the disciples and they couldn't do nothing. And he brought the boy to Jesus and when the spirit saw who Jesus was, immediately the boy started convulsing and fell down to the ground and rode over and foaming at the mouth. And I love what Jesus' response. Jesus doesn't even respond to the boy. He turns around to the father. He said, that boy got problem. How long he had this problem? How long has he been this way? He's over here foaming, kicking, screaming. Maybe I don't. And Jesus is just having this conversation with dad. Like, how long has he been like that? <laughs> and the dad said, hey, it's been since he was a child. He said, it gets worse. I mean, you, you don't know how bad it gets. This, this, this dude, my son, will throw himself into the fire or even into water trying to destroy himself. You think this guy's hurting? You think this father is hurting with what he's seeing? He's experiencing the, the heartbreak of this child, the son that he loves. And he said, I've been trying religious stuff. I've been brought him to Jesus. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do nothing. And Jesus looks at him in verse 23. He says, if you can believe all things are possible to the one who believes. And I love this dad's honesty. I love his honesty. You see, some of us sitting here today, some of us watching, some of you at East Campus, some of you, listen, we're, we, we're, we won't be honest with God. Some of us need to be honest enough to say, Pastor, it's only in theory I believe that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask to think in quantity and quality above all. He said, we only, listen, we have to be honest to say, in theory I believe this, but in practice I don't. 
And this man is honest enough in verse 24. Immediately the father cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. This week when I was in prayer time, I had a, I had a tough week this week. When I was in prayer time still seeking God, one of the things I learned, just because you fight the enemy doesn't mean that you stop praying and putting on the arm of God. And I was in prayer time, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, said every time you give an altar call in this church right now, almost 90 Nine percent of the people need to be responding to altar call, not because of uh, you know physical sins that they went off and done, but simply because there is a tremendous sin of unbelief in the church today. And it's not a condemnation; it's a conviction that God is trying to send to the American church, and it just needs to be like this man say, "Lord, I want to believe in theory. I want to believe, but you know what? In practice, I want to tell you this looks bad. I've tried this. I've tried. It hasn't worked." But he simply said, "Lord, help my unbelief." God, I'd love to see five of my unsaved friends come to Jesus this year. I'd love to see you bring revival to my neighborhood. I'd love to see you bring revival to my workplace. God, I would love that. I believe you can do it. Help my unbelief that you can do it through me. Lord, I'd love to see my co-workers, my teammates say, Lord, I'd love to see my marriage turn around with, 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 with my husband, my wife, my kids coming to you. God, I would love that. God, I believe that you, your, your will, not, well, your, it's not your will that any should perish. God, I would love to believe that. But God, help, help my unbelief. I want to believe that you're able to do super abundantly above all that we ask to think in quantity and quality. But God, I'm going to have to acknowledge to you, I just don't know. I'm not quite sure. I repent of my unbelief, God. Most Christians don't want to do that. Because we're more comfortable walking out in theory saying, oh, I believe the Bible, Pastor Phil. I believe the Word of God, Pastor Phil. I believe, I believe. And yet in practice, your life is not demonstrated. And the world is crying out right now for somebody who says, will somebody step up and say, I believe that God is able to do super abundantly in quantity and quality more than we ask that we think. I keep three, I keep, well, if you come in my office, I got a lot of stuff in my office. I've been here 18 years. We haven't even changed the carpet in my office, and my carpet's probably the most wore out there is. And, but we've done a lot of stuff, and that's okay. But, but I, I, I pray a lot in my office. I have a lot of books in my office, but I keep photos in my office. I keep things around me that trigger things. And I, I got three pictures that I keep in my office that I look at probably almost on a daily basis. I, I brought them here. The first one is a picture of Miss Rhonda. When we just got engaged. That was back when they actually put the engagement announcements in the newspapers. She's 17 years old right there. She weighed under 100 pounds in that picture. I'm walking this way as I'm talking. You see that, right? I, I keep that picture and it's close by where I look at it because every day when I look at that picture, I remind myself how lucky she was to get this dude right here. You know, I'm just, no, you know I'm just lying right there, don't you? But I look at that picture almost on a daily, Friday we'll be married 45 years. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we could have been one of the last couples on the dance floor last night had we been dancing when they said, you know, if you've been married less than 20 years or more than 20 years, you know, or less than 20, what, you know, they do some of that. But we wasn't up dancing. I, I saved my boogie for somewhere else, okay? So I don't, I just, but listen, I, I look at, I look at that photo, and all, and all kidding, this is, I look at that photo, and I, and, I, I, and I remember, I said, God, we were but kids, we made a covenant. We made a vow with you. We, we didn't know what we was doing. We, we thought we did. But it's through our lives of 45 years of compassion and kindness and forgiveness, her having to give me far more than I've ever had to forgive her 
that I can stand before this church and I can say proudly, I've been married to the same woman for 45 years. I have friends that go back 42 years that actually still see something in my life that they'll drive hundreds of miles and stay in service with me. I, I think that says something about the character and the integrity of my life. And I don't want to forget that. I don't want to leave that out. And, and by no means is that ever trying to demean. If you've had to go through a broken relationship, you've had to go through a divorce, by no means am I demeaning that. Uh, my, I, my daughter that got married last night, it was, it was heartbreaking uh, several years ago when, when the path that she chose outside of God's will. Now she let God choose her husband. She let God bring the right man. And they've got a great family. They, they've got a blended family they're bringing. It's going to be a tremendous set. But I, I see the handiwork of God. I don't want to forget that. Second picture I keep in my office is a picture of Teddy Roosevelt that somebody gave me. I've often used this quote, but I keep this, I keep this uh, picture very close by where I can see it every day, and it simply talks about it's not the credit who counts, counts, it's not the man who points out the strong man that stumbles. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood. And it just keeps going on concerning criticism. And you know, as well as I know, if you're a man of vision, if you're a man of purpose, you're a man of destiny, sometimes when you, when you want to fulfill what God's put in your heart, you're going to have to deal with critics. Come on, somebody say amen. Some of you, yeah, you know that. But here's the third picture I keep in my Matter of fact, this one sits right behind my desk where I can turn around and see this picture every day. And for some of you that don't recognize it, some of you might recognize this church. This, this is the picture of the building that we took in 2000, October the 14th, the first time I ever drove up on this property. Had a gravel parking lot, surrounded by cornfields, had one facility about 6,500 square feet. And we walked, when we drove up on that car, uh, the, 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 uh, the parking lot that day, getting ready to meet that afternoon with the board. God spoke to my life and he said, I'm going to call you to this church. This will be the last church that you'll ever pastor. I'm thinking, God, am I going to die or something? I mean, I mean... <laughs> Because I'd, I'd pastored churches, you know, after five or six years, they would move you to some other church. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is it. But then God said, no, you're, you're coming there. There will be a lifetime call that I'm going to put on your life. And you'll see the, everything, everything in your life that, that people have tolerated. I'm bringing you to a church where people are going to celebrate your giftedness and your vision. And I keep that picture close by because it, it reminds me uh, of God's guidance in my life and God's guidance in this church. And the photo reminds me that, that the time that you and I have been given upon this face of this earth is, is we, we don't know what that length is. But listen, the question that I keep asking myself and the question that I'm trying to put around your thought process this morning is just simply, will you believe Ephesians 3.20? Will you believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask to think in quantity and quality? Will you believe that? And listen, if you're here this morning and, and you're, you're just checking church out and you're not even a believer yet, listen, I, I thank you for being here. And listen, I'd stay as long as you need to try to figure this God thing out. Be comfortable with understanding that you're in a church that doesn't believe there's any such thing as a dumb question. Well, I don't understand that. Don't ask the question. There's not a dumb question. If you're here this morning and maybe you, you, you've come into this church and you're, you're already a believer, but you know your life isn't where it should be, you need to be discipled. Listen, find people, connect with people, get people in front of you, get people that can mentor you, look at people that will model for you the, the life that God wants you to live in your life. Find a way to build those relationships. Maybe you come into this place like we've had many in the last 18 years. You've been wounded by the church. You've been wounded by other people. You've been hurt. And God brought you here to be healed. And listen, and, and you're going through that healing process. You're gifted. You're talented. You have abilities. But somehow or another, God says, I want you to sit. You, you need to get in the emergency room. And after you've been in the emergency room, I need to keep you in recovery room for a while. And if that's you... 
My, my thought to you is simply take as long as you need to take to, heal, to be healed. But listen, ultimately, purpose in your life to become a healed healer. See, some people wants to get in intensive care and stay there the rest of their lives. Well, I've been hurt, and, you know, I tried this, and, and you know, it didn't work, and I, I don't know. Listen, listen, pray through that. Ask God to help you get through that stuff. Eventually understand that he made a deposit in your life for a reason. He put gifts and talents in your life for a reason. Get healed and then become a healed healer. Well, good preaching, Pastor Phil. But here's the last group I want to address in the, in the final moments of this message. If you're here this morning and you're just saying, hey, Pastor Phil, I'm punching the clock. I'm checking the boxes about going to church on a Sunday. And you're living your own agenda. You're living your own life. You have absolutely no intention of following the purpose of God and the passion of God. You have absolutely no intention of getting in the fight. You're living your own life. You're thinking your own thoughts. And you refuse to live your life in such a way that people look at you and say, you know what, that person believes Ephesians 3.20. Here's my comment to you. Repent. Repent. Ask God for forgiveness. Tell him you believe, but you're struggling with your unbelief. God, I believe that you're able to do what you say that you're able to do, but I'm not quite sure what that looks like. I believe your word says I'm a light shining. I'm a new life living. I'm a darkness overpowering. I'm a praise producing. I'm a river life flowing. I'm a hell's gate trampling, victorious, unstoppable force in this world. I believe that, but I'm not quite sure, God, how that looks and what can do. Lord, help my unbelief. I have so many people saying, well, Pastor, I just don't know how God could use me. A study was recently done, and the study was looking at what's the difference between people who do things and people who don't do things. Millions of dollars was put in this study. All kind of database was brought together, and when they drilled it down, the difference between people who do things and people who don't do things is simple. The people who do things, do things. That's it. They do things. And we've all heard people say, yeah, but you know what, Pastor, I'm just not quite sure God could use me to do things. We take all kind of leadership tests in this church and with our staff and sometimes even with our volunteers. I believe in strength finders. I believe in learning your personality. I believe in, in all that. That's, that simply makes it. Let me tell you what does bother me. It bothers me when you try to use your personality or you try to use one of your weaknesses as an excuse to define yourself. The power to do more isn't your ability. It's the power of God that's in us. It's his power, not your power. Yeah, but you know, Pastor Phil, I took a personality test and I'm just an introvert. And you know how introverts are introverted people. I mean, we just, I mean, we're just so introverted. <laughs> God knows your personality. And I've discovered in my own life, it's not, where my, it's not in my strengths that I often excel. It's often in my weaknesses that I acknowledge that I humbly come before God and I say, God, if you don't help me here, I am in trouble. You ever had people say to you in conversation, yeah, but you just don't understand, I'm dumb. I don't know nothing. I'm dumb. When it comes to the Bible, I'm dumb. Now, let's say, just for the sake of argument, it's not just low self-esteem that person's having. Maybe they're having a little slow self-esteem. Maybe they need a little encouragement. But let's just say for the sake of argument, I've got the mic, you're listening, I'm talking. Let's just say they are dumb. Okay? They're dumb. D-U-M-B, dumb. 
You ever heard of Samson? You ever heard of Samson? Listen, Samson was so dumb, he allowed his girlfriend to tie him up three times. And he still spilled the beans. Samson wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, folks. He dumb. But did God use him? You ever had people say, you know, Pastor Phil, I'm just too young. I'm young in the Lord. I'm young geographically. You understand when you look at Josiah, Josiah was eight years old when he became king of Israel. Josiah was eight years old when he became king of Israel. Josiah couldn't even walk across the road without his mama holding his hand. And yet when you read Josiah's story, God used him magically to, to alter the entire course of the nation of Israel. Why? He believed that God was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all in quantity and quality that you asked to think, according to the power that worked within us. You ever heard of Joan of Arc? You understand Joan of Arc was 18 years old when she died? And only by, by the time she's 18 years old, she's, listen, she is making history. She's making history. Why? Because she understood even God could use her. So you're dumb. So you're young. You ever heard somebody say, well, I just feel strange. You know, Pastor Phil, I just, I've just been misunderstood all my life. I just feel strange. I feel weird. And again, for the sake of argument here and for time, let's just say it isn't a low self-esteem. Let's just say, hey, dude, you're weird. You are, I mean, you walk in the building, it weirds us people sometimes. Are you with me? Do you know that John the Baptist had wore camel's hair for his suit and he ate locusts and while camel hair suits never came in the style. <laughs> Nobody was lining up and saying, oh, did you see John the Baptist in that nice camel's hair suit? Oh, where can I get one of those? Yet God used him. We got rock stars today. They can wear some of the weirdest outfits or have the weirdest haircuts in one concert. By the next concert, everybody shows up wearing the same thing, got the same stinking haircut. And we're worried about being a little weird. What about this one? I love it. You ever hear people say, you ever, you ever hear people say, well, I'm just ugly. I just, I mean, I'm just not attractive, Pastor Phil. I mean, I think you need a little char char a charisma. You, you, know, you know, you need a little looks. And, I, and I'm, I'm just ugly. So for the sake of argument, let's just say you're ugly. Okay, you're ugly. Just for the sake of argument, you're ugly. You ever heard of Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln had a disease that affected his bones, that he had knots all over his face. It's like joints in, in arthritis joints that swell up, and you get big knots there with people. Abraham Lincoln had that all over his face. History says he was shaking hands one time as he, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a line as he was running for senator, and this little 10-year-old girl come up to him and said, you're the ugliest man I've ever seen. You need to grow a beard and cover up your ugliness. And the rest is history. You ever see the photo with Abraham Lincoln without a beard? So every one of us guys that's got beards, you know what we're doing. We're covering up. <laughs> I'm just, Joe, I'm just, I just shaved mine off, right? Okay. Abraham Lincoln is known as a, the most popular president in, in our history, and yet he was ugly. I mean, I, I could go on and on. You, you know, you ever heard people say, well, you know what? I, I, just, I just have emotional issues, Pastor Phil. I mean, I'm just, I'm just emotionally not stable. You ever heard of Winston Churchill? Winston Churchill had what he called his black dog. It wasn't a dog. It wasn't an animal. It was his battle with depression. 
Winston Churchill battled depression so bad that for one time, for a 12-month a month period, 24 hours a day, they had to put him on guard and they were watching out for him because they were afraid that he would take his life. And yet, if you know your history well, you think you struggle with my southernness. If it wasn't for Winston Churchill, I'd be preaching in German today. It just went right over some of your head. Come on, Lindsay. Come on, Pastor Lindsay. I got to quit. Do you believe? Yes. Yes. I'm in church, Pastor. I believe. Does your life reflect it? When you come up to your difficulties and your struggles, are you stepping out there and you're saying, wow, God, you promised Ephesians 3 and 20 that my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all they're asked to think you can able to, you're able to do it in quantity and quality according to the power that works within us. What's the application? First, don't be guilty of not having because you don't ask. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. There's something about asking. There's something about making a petition. When's the last time you asked for something bigger than just a little bit of help? Secondly, don't be guilty of not having because you doubt God's ability or His willingness to give it to you. We should never doubt God's ability or His willingness to give us what He says He will give us in His Word. Number three, don't be guilty of praying small prayers. Stop your wimpy praying. If you don't have a vision bigger than saying, God bless me, God help me, go to the Word of God, read the Bible, get to pray the Word of God, pray the promises of God. I've got another side in my office that I keep it. I can look where I'm sitting in my desk chair when I'm, when I'm writing messages or whatever I'm doing. I can look across there and it says in great big words, think big, talk big, ask big, believe big because God is big. I don't want to be accused of praying wimpy prayers. I don't want to be accused of having a wimpy vision. Why? Because of me? No, but because of who God is. Philip Brooks said this. He said, pray the largest prayers. You cannot think of a prayer so large that God cannot answer. Pray for, pray not for crutches. Pray for wings. Man, I'm enjoying this. I'm having fun. East Campus, pastor there, North Judson, you guys get ready. Westville, get ready. Listen, here's the last thing. Pray for yourself. Pray for this church. That for His glory, that God would do through us that which is humanly unexplainable. Look, 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 look. Pray that God would do through us which is humanly unexplainable. You think that'd be a big prayer? You think that would be an awesome prayer? God, do something through my life that is humanly unexplainable. How did that happen? I don't know. I've just been praying like Pastor Phil said. I just pray I'm reading the Bible. The Bible says I'm a light shining. I'm a new life living. I'm a darkness overpowering. I'm a praise producing. I'm a river of, of life flowing. I'm a hell's gates trampler. I'm a victorious, unstoppable force in the Lord. In, in the world, God used me to do what is humanly inexplainable. Oh.